My talk has uh, four parts. On uh, the first part, I will try to introduce what is the uh, what are the known phenomena in uh, acoustics and elastic dynamics that we are interested to study. And in this part, I will also um, you will see that some of the problems are related to the Einstein equation in general relativity. I will mention a little bit about that. In the second part, I will go to the mass, uh, the, the mass tool. So this is the, uh, the tool that we use to analyze the wave interaction and uh, try to, uh, and uh, so this is the distorted plane waves. And then uh, I will mention some work that we, uh, we have done with uh, Mike Lassas and the Gunther Woman on the uh, wave equation uh, and the Einstein equation. So in the the last two parts will be uh, about the acoustic equation and the elastic wave equation. So uh, these are the, uh, based on uh, the joint work with Martin de Hoop and the Gunther Woman. And the third part, I will talk about the uh, nonlinear actions from the interface of uh, nonlinear material and this problem is to determine the interface. And the last part is uh, in, still in progress, but it's about the elastic wave. All right, so let's start with the uh, nonlinear phenomenon uh, in elastic waves. So it is known that certain elastic materials has, such as solids and rocks have a strong nonlinear properties. There's a very good review of uh, Ostrovsky and Johnson. So uh, basically uh, people want to uh, <coughs> use the wave interaction to understand such phenomena because if you think about the wave, inter uh, wave propagation, if the material is linear, if you send two waves, they, they will just cross each other and there nothing happens by the uh, linear superposition principle, right? But if the wave are, uh, if the material is nonlinear and the wave, you've sent two waves, then there might be a new signal generated from that. And that would tell you that is, there is a nonlinear phenomenon there. So people have designed these experiments to understand such interactions. The picture on the left is from a paper of a Roland, a Taylor and Rollins in the uh, 64. So uh, this is, uh, in, the, in the middle you have the specimen, supposed to have some uh, nonlinear phenomenon, uh, properties. And then there are two transducers on the boundary. They will send ultrasonic waves into this specimen. And then these waves are supposed to uh, meet in, inside this specimen. And then there's another measurement, uh, there's another transducer on the boundary to measure the, nonlinear, the possible nonlinear responses. And from that, uh, people want to, uh, so the first thing is people want to see, categorize such nonlinear responses. And then from that nonlinear response, we want to determine the nonlinear properties of the, of the elastic material. So, uh, oh yeah, I have to say that uh, in, uh, in the literature, there are uh, basically two ways to, uh, uh, for this wave interaction. One is collinear, you send the wave in the same direction. The other one is non-collinear. Uh, here in this talk, I will only consider the non-collinear case. The wave are sent into, uh, from two different directions. So, uh, the similar, uh, on the, you see that the picture on the right is the, from, the, uh, from the paper of Kupchenov, Smith, and Kaplan. So this picture has a <clears throat> background in the, seismo, uh, in the uh, geophysical exploration. So you can think that this is the underground formation of the Earth, and the, red, uh, the, uh, the yellow surface is the surface of the ground. And we want to know, we want to use the wave interaction and nonlinear property to understand the underground formation of the Earth. It has been long suggested that uh, by using this nonlinear uh, phenomena, one can get a better image of the underground formation of the Earth because the non sometimes the contrast in the nonlinear parameter is stronger than the ones in the linear ones. So you can get a better image from the nonlinear uh, interaction. Okay, so now in this scenario, you will design two sources on the ground and then you send two waves and hopefully they will uh, focus on the, uh, this blue, this blue horizontal uh, region is the uh, nonlinear material and the rest are linear. So there's a clear interface of the nonlinear material and the linear material. And then you send the two waves. If they meet at the interface and there will be uh, hopefully a nonlinear response that reflect it to the uh, surf surface of the ground and you record that, you want to determine the location of the interface. So this is the, uh, uh, I would call this problem interface problem because there is another uh, similar problem in, in the acoustic range, okay? All right, so to, under, to analyze the wave interaction, uh, there's very um, commonly used model in this literature, it's called five constant model. So we need a wave equation to describe the wave uh, movement. So uh, let's just start, this is very classical, so I will um, just, let's look at the model and see what are the nonlinear parameters. So let's consider an elastic body uh, occupying an open boundary region omega in R3, and we'll use point x to denote the point in R3. So suppose the body is deformed, uh, then the point x is moved to another point. 
if you consider, uh, so this, this displacement can be described by this vector u is x prime minus x. Now, if you consider the change of the length element, then you will see the only difference in the change of the ad length element is the 2uik dx i dx k. This uik will be called the strain tensor. And you can write it down explicitly uh, in this, uh, the last line here. Okay, this is the strain tensor. And you can notice that this strain tensor is nonlinear in this u, because u is this displacement vector and describes the movement uh, inside the body. So now the strain tensor is uh, actually nonlinear in this u. Of course, in the linear theory, theory when you assume that the dis displacement is small, uh, you will drop the last uh, nonlinear term and you will get the first two terms. That's what you used in strain tensor in the linear theory. Okay, so now the energy density of the uh, of the body is a function of the strain tensor. But here we don't, con we, we don't consider other effects of uh, uh, physical quantities such as temperature, so this energy will be just depend on the strain tensor. So now for, for small deformation, we can obtain the expression of the strain tensor explicitly using the uh, series expansion. So now if the material is isotropic, we get the uh, uh, first line, so it's epsilon is epsilon zero plus uh, one over two lambda, and then plus mu. Here we use Einstein summation formation, uh, uh, convention. So usually if, the, if you only consider linear material, you will have the first line. And now we want to consider nonlinear effects. So we will have the cubic term on the second line, which is one over three A times this. Uh, you, have, you see there are three U's, U, I, K, I, L, K, L and the next term is b times u i k square u l l and, and, and the term c. So this lambda mu are the linear parameters, are called Lamey coefficients, is well known. In, uh, and the, the other parameter, a, b, and c, are related to the nonlinear properties of the material. So in the literature, this, all these all this, uh, uh, parameters are constant, and this model is called the uh, five constant model after the work of uh, Goldberg. Okay, uh, but we can uh, generalize to a function. But here, let's just consider the five constant model. Okay, so now <clears throat> to derive the wave equation, so you just consider the, uh, uh, start with this uh, uh, energy density and took the, you take the derivative with respect to the dum dxn. The formula is not important, but you can see that the important thing is that, uh, is that if you take the divergence of this tensor, you will get the inner force in the, in the body. And then you can derive the dynamical equation using Newton's second law. So this is rho times du squared, dt squared is equal to the divergence of this s of u plus f. So if you are familiar with the linear elastic theory, uh, this s will be related to this uh, strain, uh, the stress tensor. So you would only have this lambda u term and the two mu term, uh, but without this du m dx and the du m dx j. So, uh, Basically, for linear theory, you, had, you, you only have this term and this term, and the rest are gone. But for nonlinear theory, here we would have uh, all these terms here is the U M, uh, this two U's here, and there are two U. So therefore, in this equation here, this is a second, you would have a second order derivative, but also it's nonlinear because you have all these terms here and also the term here. So this will be the, uh, the nonlinear wave, elastic wave equation that uh, uh, Wiley is used in this, uh, um, in this study. Okay, of course, if you linearize, you will get the isotropic elastic uh, wave equation. Okay, so now using this equation, so using this equation, people uh, analyze the uh, interaction for waves using, uh, using plane waves, spherical waves, and Gaussian beams. They are, the literature is extensive. I only uh, list a few works. So, <clears throat> For example, uh, you have this Kufshinov, Smith, Kaplan work for rocks, and the corner of uh, Demchenko for elastic solid. And there's some older works goes back to Jones and Kobe and uh, Taylor Rollins. So uh, basically, all these waves are smooth functions, and uh, the characterization of these waves is their frequency. Because you have plane wave, you have a, you have these plane waves with a fixed frequency. Therefore, you have two waves with given frequency. If this material is linear, they will just uh, what you would you would observe is just the, the wave of the uh, given frequency, right? There's no uh, new things. However, if the material is nonlinear, then we are expect to see the nonlinear responses are recognized as the difference in the frequency. And if you observe a wave of a different frequency, then you will see there this is the nonlinear response. So that's the approach in the uh, more physical literature, and how how do they recognize the uh, nonlinear response? 
Okay, so <clears throat> now the similar phenomena uh, can be, uh, uh, the elastic wave equation is very complicated. The system, the U displacement vector is a three vector, and there's a system of uh, hyperbolic, uh, uh, quotient linear hyperbolic differential equations, nonlinear. And uh, here, uh, so we can uh, consider the acoustic wave equation. This will be a scalar wave equation. So uh, this, is a, this is the model. Uh, for an acoustic wave equation, it's a linear part, and then we have this nonlinear part. We add a quadratic nonlinearity. And here, uh, all this uh, C, the sound speed and the density are dependent on time. Uh, so this also this A also depends on uh, time. So more generally, we can uh, consider the scalar wave equation uh, on a Lorentzian manifold because uh, you can associate, for this linear part, we can find a Lorentzian metric and uh, you can associate this linear part to a Lorentzian metric. So therefore, it's useful, actually you can see that it's helpful and useful to consider this Lorentzian, uh, this scalar wave equation on a Lorentzian manifold. So let's consider this four-dimensional Lorentzian manifold, mg. If you, are not, if you are not familiar with this, you can take this mg to be the Minkowski space-time, which is just uh, R4, and uh, the metric will be this uh, standard uh, metric in the coordinate. So now the uh, uh, box G will be the Laplace Beltrami operator. So this box G replaced this whole thing here, this linear part here. And if you're not familiar, this box G will be the standard uh, metric, uh, uh, standard uh, operate, uh, wave operator for this metric, for, for Minkowski space time. And then uh, I will replace this uh, A, this quadratic nonlinear term, we can consider a more general one. This H is smooth in X and U, this is a nonlinear term, okay? So F is the source term supposed to generate the, uh, the wave. Okay, so this will be the scalar wave equation. Now, the nonlinear ph phenomena also observed in the acoustic range. There is an example of this uh, vibroacoustography method of Fatemi and Greenleaf. So this method is used in uh, medical imaging. Um, so the, tar the, the goal is to uh, detect the harder object, like a tumor, inside a, a soft, uh, soft medium, uh, like a liquid, human li uh, tissue human tissue. So uh, the method is that you, uh, they, they use two uh, confocal transducers to produce two waves, two beams, and this ultrasound beams will be focused to the uh, surface of the object. So now <clears throat> the, their goal is to focus this uh, beam on the uh, surface. So if, the, if these beams are focused to the uh, surface of the object, then a nonlinear uh, a nonlinear response in the acoustic range is observed, and this is recorded, recorded by this hydrophone near this object. So if, if this uh, if the beams do not focus on the surface of the, of the object, there's no nonlinear response. That's the, uh, and then using this nonlinear response, they are able to determine the uh, location of the interface. That's how they, did, how they find this uh, tumor inside the body, uh, got the image. So here, if you consider, if, if you compare this example with the interface problem for elastic wave, you'll see that these two are very similar. You, you send two waves, and this wave, if they meet at the interface of the uh, nonlinear material, then uh, you're expected to see some nonlinear response. And using that, you want to recover the, uh, the location. So it's also an interface problem. So now, okay, so now, Curly the philosopher woman in 2013 considered determination of space-time structure using nonlinear interaction of waves. So this now we go to the uh, uh, general relativity. So actually, uh, the so actually there goes to uh, originally they, they considered the Einstein equation in the uh, in the general relativity, and the, their problem is to determine the space-time structure, uh, for example, of the universe around us using the gra interaction of gravitational waves. Now here, uh, for the simplified model, we can consider it for the nonlinear wave equation, the scalar wave equation. So <clears throat> basically, uh, so now this is the picture, and it's a very uh, good point to introduce the space-time picture, uh, the Lorentzian picture of the wave propagation. So suppose this is R3, this plane is R3, and our Earth is represented by this disk here. And what they want to do is they want to send, uh, so this, is, this is at the time zero, say this is at time zero. And then what we want to do is we want to send these waves. We want to send four, for this particular problem, we want to send four waves. And these four waves will uh, travel to the outer space from the Earth. And uh, they, so here we have to assume that this media, the, the Earth is surrounded by some nonlinear medium. Uh, for the Einstein equation, this is natural. So now, the, 
if these four waves meet at a point, if this, everything is linear, nothing happens. But if it's nonlinear, then there will be a nonlinear response. There's, not the, there's a nonlinear response, and this new wave will travel back to the Earth at a later time here. So, so you start from, you, you send a signal from here, time zero, and you have to wait for time, for some time, until this wave travel back to the Earth. And using this signal, we hope to construct the uh, space-time structure around Earth for the space-time where this wave have traveled to. So then you gather the information, you want to determine that. So this is, this is one, another example that used the nonlinear response to determine the uh, for the inverse problem. Okay. So now, in the mathematical community, uh, <clears throat> the uh, study of nonlinear interaction of progressing waves has been investigated from the point of view of propagation and inter nonlinear interaction of singularities. So there is, uh, uh, this is actively studied in the 80s and the 90s, uh, so from the work of uh, uh, Rauch and Reed for one dimensional uh, problem, uh, one space dimensional uh, wave equation. And Bonny in the 80s developed this uh, paradifferential calculus and the second microlocalization method to understand this interaction. Uh, Melrose, Reiter, and Sabrato, uh, for, for semi wave equation, they, they use the geometric method to blow up and to uh, study the same thing. So Aniak considers quasi, this wave interaction for quasi-linear equations. So now for this uh, mathematical, uh, for all this method, okay, the characterization of the wave is different from the uh, plane waves used in the physical literature. So here, uh, <coughs> the, in, the incoming waves are characterized by their wavefront. So these waves have a clear wavefront. For example, you have the Heaviside function. This side is 0, this side is 1. You have a clear uh, interface where this function is not continuous. So now this characterizes this wave. And uh, now the, suppose this wave is propagating. And uh, if, the if this m material is nonlinear and the two, two waves interact, you will help to generate a new wave. And this new wave will be also characterized by their wavefront. If you see a new new wave front, then that will be the new wave for, uh, for corresponding to the nonlinear uh, response. So that's the difference between these two approaches. And uh, in most of these uh, this works, uh, they, uh, <coughs> they deal with nonlinear wave equations, and they want to show the, uh, the possible uh, range of the nonlinear response. They will tell you that these are the, uh, the region that the nonlinear response could be propagate to. Uh, and their explicit examples are constructed to show that such nonlinear response are indeed generated. Because these this works are mostly upper bound on the nonlinear response, but uh, sometimes you want to know when this thing actually is generated, right? So, and then we can use that. So, therefore, in our, in, in our work, we try to uh, use this kind of idea and combine with some other ideas to show that in certain cases, when this uh, nonlinear response is indeed generated, and the, then by using this wavefront characterization, we are able to, uh, yeah, we are able to extract information from nonlinearity. So uh, the reason that we don't want to use the uh, um, plane wave in interact plane wave approach is that uh, uh, for this for this approach, because the wavefront is very clear, we can we can narrow down the interaction region uh, precisely because we know the wave front, so we can narrow down. For the plane wave, it takes a uh, uh, plane wave uh, lives in a larger region, and the interaction region is hard to uh, narrow down. Okay. So this is more, uh, suppose more precise. Okay, so uh, let's go to the uh, the math part. Uh, so I quickly go over this. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, let, let's consider this model, this uh, uh, scalar wave equation for Lorenzian, uh, on a Lorentzian manifold with this general nonlinearity. Uh, so you can expand this nonlinearity in terms of the Taylor expansion. So I have the quadratic term, a cubic term, and so on and so forth. And uh, we will assume that this H is smooth, and also this A for any given, oh, now I have to say that this is X is in space time. It's not the space point. This, is, this M is a four dimensional uh, <laughs> manifold. So X is in space time. So now we assume that uh, for any given space point, a space time point, this, this A, B, C, D are uh, not all vanishing. So we need this nonlinearity to solve the problem because if it's everything linear, then um, we, we, there's no nonlinear response. Okay, so now what is a distorted plane wave? So now let's consider this linear wave equation. Okay, so if, linearize, if you linearize this equation, you will get this linear part, which is here. So we want to construct a source f so that the linear wave is u, the solution, this will be the linear wave, travels near a fixed rate. 
So now if you consider this picture, this picture is in R3. Okay, this is the space picture. Now suppose you have a point source that emits a signal at a certain moment, then you will see this wave front on this uh, sphere, right? So that's the spherical wave, and you have a clear wave front. If it, okay, so now what we want to do is want to focus this thing along a certain direction. So therefore, we want to construct a source which is supported on this disk here. This, uh, this is supposed to be a disk. This F is, this F is here, and uh, the wave front of F is here. Now, if we start this wave propagation by the Huygens principle or uh, this wave propagation, you know that this wave will be propagated along this uh, direction. So it's expa expanding, so it will go to this direction. And the later time, you will see a wave front like this on the bigger disk in this U. Okay, so now this is the space picture, right? You have to imagine that there's a time uh, and the, the sphere are expanding. So now, let's go to the space-time picture. Okay, so now we stack things up. Now this is R3. Now we have this point, correspond, cre this point correspond to a point in space-time. This, this signal only emit at time zero. And therefore, you would have this whole sphere here, this whole sphere correspond to this future pointing light cone. And then, this source, we want to put it in this disk, will correspond to a curve on this, uh, correspond to the red curve on this light cone. And therefore, if you start a wave propagation, this new, this wave front will be represented by this shaded region, I will call it K here. So now the source, the, the wave front of the source is here at Y, and the wave front of the U will be on this K region here on the light cone. So it's just a part of the light cone. Okay, so now uh, all these things, the nice thing is all these things can be described mathematically very precisely. So uh, I would just, uh, so th this page I will show you what is this uh, d mathematical description of the F and the, uh, the U. So this can be described by using notion, uh, uh, Hormander notion of conormal distributions. So uh, this, this type of distribution are very common. Uh, you, you always see this uh, delta distribution or heavy side function, right? They have a, uh, this side, heavy side function, this is zero, this is one, so uh, it's conormal. The singularity is in the normal direction of the interface. And so therefore, uh, if for any manif some manifold Y, you can see it's a normal, conormal space. And then uh, all this, this, this type of distributions, conormal distribution will be denoted by this uh, I mu of N star Y. So you should imagine that this Y tells you where the function is not, is not smooth. And uh, this mu tells you how smooth, this order tells you how smooth the, the distribution is actually is. So the next thing is, okay, so, uh, for any, this, uh, if you work locally near the point on this y, you can always lo you can always choose the local coordinates to parameterize your manifold and its uh, uh, conormal bundle, so that any of this type of uh, conormal distribution can be written as a oscillatory integral with this uh, with this symbol a here in this symbol class. You don't, you don't need to worry about the symbol class. What is important is that if this a is not vanishing. If this A is not vanishing, then this F will be singular. This F will be not smooth on the interface, on this Y. So therefore, we can relate the, uh, how do you tell your function you have a wave front, then uh, you, can, you can tell it from, you know, this symbol is not vanishing. So these two are related. Therefore, you know, if the symbol is not vanishing, you know there is a clear wave front. Okay, so now this is a source. This is source F. So now using some uh, linear theory for the wave equation, uh, we, can, uh, we, we know this uh, linear solution can be represented as the causal inverse applies to F. And there is a micro-local description of the causal inverse of the, uh, uh, of the wave operator. And using all these theories, we can show that the, the linear solution U is also a conormal distribution, but this time is to the uh, manifold K. And uh, you remember that this K is uh, this piece here. So you start from this y, y is the uh, wave front of your source, and then you generate a u, which is conormal to the uh, flow out on the, on the sphere. So now this u will be called distorted plane wave. The thing is that all this construction, all these waves have a clear wave front that we can keep track of. Okay, so now let's consider nonlinear action. This will be the, the linear wave. Now let's consider nonlinear action of these distorted plane waves. So uh, for this particular problem, we need four waves. So uh, I would take uh, four parameters and take this uh, source will be four, the sum of four sources, okay, the so four sources. And then the, the V, the linearized part will be the sum of four distorted plane waves. So we have four distorted plane waves. 
Now we we'll consider a solution of this wave equation, nonlinear wave equation. So using this uh, uh, successive approximation, you can imagine that in a certain function space, your solution will, can be expanded in terms of the epsilon ij, right? So now we have all this expansion terms. So especially, you know, this term will correspond to wave interaction. This will correspond to three wave interaction. And this term, this term is more interesting to us is this represents the four wave interaction. So through some uh, calculation, you can write down every term. So you see the, this, the, the second, the two wave interaction, three wave interaction, two wave interaction, you only have V i, V j here. It's a multiple of uh, two uh, functions. That's why it's nonlinear. And the U3, you have uh, multiplication of three uh, distorted plane waves. And for this term, four wave interaction, you would have multiplication four uh, terms. So we're interested in this term, so uh, we just take A and B to be zero and focus on this term here. Okay, let's see what is, uh, what, do we have any nonlinear response from this term? So now, uh, suppose we have this, uh, this four waves, right? We have these four waves, and they should travel along these four rays in space time. And you have to imagine that's k, k, uh, k1, 2, 3, 4, they are uh, co-dimension 1, some manifold are, are around these curves. Okay? They're not just curves because the wave travel near this rays. And now you consider interaction, right? So uh, if there's two of them intersect at the co-dimension 2, uh, two some manifold, that would be uh, you know, two. You no, know, this ki are three-dimensional object. Uh, if the two of them intersect, they will get a two-dimensional object, which is surface. And the three of them inter intersect will give you a one-dimensional object, which is a curve. And the four of them intersect at a point in space-time. Now, four of them intersect at a point, and this point will be in space-time. And in space-time, this goes back to the, the picture I showed you before, this point in space-time will be a point source. So there, therefore, this point will emit the signal to the future pointing light cone. This is just a spherical wave. So therefore, Using this type of argument, we, uh, in this paper, we sh uh, with, in this work with Matilasas and Gunsen Woman, we show that the interaction term is a conormal distribution to this future pointing light cone here. And uh, the principal symbol of this interaction term is not always vanishing. So therefore, we know that this, this cone here is the wavefront of the new nonlinear response. And because the symbol is not vanishing, we know that this, is, uh, this has to exist. It's not just upper bound. This wave is uh, is traveling on this. Uh, is generated uh, here. Okay, so this is the main tool we use. Okay, so here I have a I have a video to show this interaction. Uh, I should thank Laurie Oxanen uh, for for making this video. Oh, sorry. Uh, so now this is a this is interaction of four distor four distorted plane waves. Okay, they're moving to towards each other. Now they start to interact. First the two and the three and then four. What is generated is this uh, sphere and this black belt on the sphere. So uh, I have to explain that uh, this, of course, this, this is a picture in R3 and the sphere corresponds to the point source. And this black belt corresponds to the, uh, the, the wave generated by the three wave interaction. So you see, uh, you see, you have a, sorry, uh, If I can go, go back to the previous page. Uh, okay, so it, it, you remember that there, there are interaction term U2, U3, U4. And uh, the U4 correspond to this uh, generate this uh, two-wave two inter two interaction does not generate new waves. And three interaction will generate this black belt. And four-wave interaction will generate the sphere. So different number of wave interaction will generate different kind of uh, wave front. All right, so. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Right, right. That's that's what happens when A and B are not zero. Yeah, if they're zero, then there's just just the force order interaction. Yeah. Uh, if if there's zero, uh, if C if C is not. Oh, oh, I see. So, uh, yeah, if A and B are not zero, yeah, then. Uh, if A and B, yeah, they, they could generate because they are. Uh, 
Right, right, because, uh, because you, ha you can have a wave from here. You see, this, this is also four wave interaction, but it's from, it comes from a next order iteration. So you have this uh, QG of uh, A, and uh, th there are two here. If A is non vanishing, say, and then you would have this term here, and then they will generate a spherical wave. It's still the four wave interaction. Yeah. Okay, so now using this, uh, this type of argument, we are able to prove uh, a lot of theorem. Uh, roughly speaking, the theorem tells you that uh, the, uh, we can determine the geometry of this manifold, including the topological differentiable structure of the manifold and the uh, metric G, or its, con or its conformal class in certain cases. And the, uh, the nonlinear, uh, and also we can determine the nonlinear terms such as the Terry coefficients, uh, expansion of the, to the, co the coefficient of Terry expansion in the region where this wave had traveled to. So now this has been proved uh, originally for, uh, for the, uh, uh, in a query of Lassa's woman for quadratic nonlinear terms. So this is just a wave equation plus a quadratic uh, nonlinear term. And I have a work with uh, uh, Lassa's woman for the general nonlinear term here, and we are able to uh, determine the information of the nonlinear term. And also I have work with uh, uh, Ting Zhou on the uh, uh, quadratic derivative nonlinear terms. So here, uh, this, is a mod this is a toy model for the uh, many equations in mathematical physics, such as wave map equation. So you have a quadratic derivative term here. Of course, uh, the more interesting thing is to do this for Einstein equation. So a creative philosopher and Oksana woman just updated uh, uh, this work for Einstein scalar wave equations. And I have a work with Lassus woman for the Einstein Maxwell equations. So uh, in this case, uh, in this case, we try to determine the space-time structure using the interaction of the uh, gravitational and electromagnetic waves. Okay. So uh, now let's move on. Uh, let's, okay. So now let's move on to the next pro uh, next topic. So this is nonlinear response from the interface. So now we look at the uh, scalar wave equation. Here I want to be a little more general. Is we, I want to consider wave operator associated with the Riemannian metric. So here uh, we have the dt square, and this Laplace la g is Laplace Beltrami operator for a Riemannian manifold. So if you're not familiar with this, you can take this to be the ordinary Laplacian. Uh, so now we consider a semilinear wave equation of the following t uh, form. So we have a pu here, p is this, and then we have the nonlinear quadratic nonlinear term. And then this u is equal to u zero. U zero will be the incoming wave. This is the incoming wave. So now, if you remember, what is the uh, uh, so if you remember what is the non the interface problem for the acoustic equation, right? So we want to sense two waves, and then one is to meet at the interface and see the nonlinear response. So now we uh, take this incoming wave. This incoming wave consists of two parts: so epsilon one u one plus epsilon two. two Two distorted plane waves. They are uh, associated. Their wavefront are S1, S2. Okay, uh, this is associated with S1, S2. And uh, we, we don't assume that. Uh, okay. So now the important thing is we want to assume this a. A is the nonlinear parameter in the equation, right? So you have this a here, correct? The coefficient of the nonlinear term. We, there's an interface. So we want to assume this a has a conormal singularity at this interface here. Of course, you have to think this is a space-time picture. And then we consider this interaction of all these things. I have to say that uh, if you just consider two wave interaction without the interface, there's no nonlinear response, uh, as we observed, uh, as I said before. So now, if you do a successive approximation, we would have, you know, uh, this is the linear term, and nonlinear term would be this one, two, three terms. We're interested in this term because this term represents the interaction of the two different waves. So. Uh, we will assume that uh, this, uh, the wavefront and the interface intersect at a curve. This curve is in space-time. I have to say this is in space-time. And then we let lambda to be the forward-like cone of this uh, curve in the space-time. Then what we showed, uh, this is work with Martin de Hoop and Gunther Woman, is that uh, the nonlinear response is a conormal distribution to this uh, cone lambda. And also the symbol is not always va vanishing. So if these two waves meet at the interface, then there is a nonlinear response, and we are able to characterize this, uh, what is this lambda. So uh, uh, as I said, you know, if, if there's no, if this A has no uh, singularity, if A is smooth, then uh, this term would not produce any new wave. So it's really when this thing meet, at the, when this A has a singularity and these two waves meet at that singularity, you would produce this nonlinear response. So that's why it's only at the interface you will see the nonlinear response, otherwise there will be no nonlinear response. So, uh, this time I have a, I don't have a video, but I have this uh, evolution of these waves. So consider these two waves moving towards this interface as zero here. 
So these two waves moving towards it. First, what happened is that these two waves would meet. One of each of these waves would meet at the interface, and they don't meet. Uh, uh, this this is the moment before these two waves meet at the interface. And what you will get is this reflected wave from the interface. I have to say this is not linear reflection because uh, here there's linear term is fine. It's just nonlinear reflected wave. This this reflected wave are due to the singularity, the nonlinear uh, in, uh, singularity. Okay, so now this wave will keep moving, and then this is, they start to interact at the interface. What will happen is that uh, these two waves keep moving, and the reflected wave are going to the uh, other direction. So what we generate is at this point here, you have to think that this is the curve in the uh, in space time, and then they will generate us a, a wave, expanding wave like this, like in this disk. And if you if you look at from the other side, you will see that this is indeed this conic shape region. So this is the first time when this wave interact at the interface, you will get a larger sphere, and then this are the uh, represents interaction for a later time. So after the complete, after this interaction is complete, now this wave was, was still moving. Now after the interaction is complete, the wave still moving, and then they will um, they won't generate new waves, but the, the, these waves will keep moving, and therefore you will get this uh, uh, shape of a truncated cone. So this is the wavefront for the uh, new nonlinear response, and the shape is, uh, could be a distorted and truncated cone. So therefore, uh, that's why we call this a conical uh, type singularity for this type of interaction. Okay, so now uh, <clears throat> we also consider, uh, because for this problem we only consider, there's no uh, interface in the linear material, just an interface in the nonlinear material. So we also consider what happens if there's an interface in the linear material, because if you consider two materials, probably the, if the nonlinear materials are different, probably the, non, the linear ones are also different. However, uh, it's, uh, as I mentioned before, it's suggested that uh, in certain cases the nonlinear, the contrast in the nonlinear parameter are stronger than the linear one. So we, will, we work with this model that we have this nonlinear term here, but we add a perturbation uh, to the linear term, whereas Q is also uh, co-normal at the interface, has a jump in at the interface. So this is the model we consider, and we want to sh see whether we can distinguish the nonlinear response in this case. So, okay, so now we assume this delta is a small parameter, so it's just a small perturbation of that, of the uh, original model, and the Q and A are, uh, normal to the interface. So now in the linear setting, if you consider this problem, this, this problem has been studied by uh, the Hoop woman and Vashi uh, for in, uh, in, the, in the linear setting, and they, they, they carefully studied the transmitted and reflected wave for, for this equation, even without these small parameters. Uh, um, and, uh, and also in this, in this paper, they consider the perturbation is in this P, not just uh, this potential perturbation. Uh, in the backscattering setting, uh, the, if the potential has a, has a normal singularity, this uh, similar problem has been considered by Greenleaf and Woman. Uh, but uh, the analysis in that case are uh, quite involved. But using this small parameter, we are able to extract the leading term in the linear response and nonlinear response and compare their wave front. So this is the, the result that I, uh, we obtained with uh, Martin de Huber and Gunther Woman is that. Uh, so uh, in this case, we can expand the solution U in terms of epsilon and delta. There are two parameters. So this, this blue term represents the linear response. This blue term represents the linear response. And this delta times W is supposed to be the nonlinear response. And what we did here is we extracted the leading term in terms of delta of the linear response and in terms of delta of the nonlinear response. And the rest are small compared to this. So what we show there is uh, for we characterize the wave front. The wave front of the linear response is uh, contained by in this set here. So this this two s1 s2 are the original wave. This wave front of the original wave and this lambda one, lambda one lambda two are the reflected wave from the interface. And then we show that uh, the wave front of the nonlinear response is contained in the union of the linear response and this new wave lambda in, of the conical uh, conical the wave in the, like a cone, truncated cone. So we show that, you see, this part is not in the linear response, but it's in the nonlinear response. Therefore, even there's an a interface in the linear material, we are able to uh, detect the nonlinear response in this case. And uh, it's, it's this conical shape uh, wavefront. 
Okay, so now using this approach, we uh, solve the uh, inverse problem of detecting the uh, interface of the uh, nonlinear material. So in this, in this problem, we use the source, source problem. Okay, so we, we start from two, suppose we have these two rays. These two rays are supposed to focus on the point on the interface S0 here. And then the sources are constructed so that the wave would propagate along these two rays. And uh, so, uh, and then if they meet at the interface, you will see a conical type single wave traveling uh, like this, expanding to the direct, to other directions. Um, so now the, the data set we, we use is the solution U of this uh, equation, of this equation with all the sources and uh, this and these parameters can uh, arranges in this, ri in, in this uh, range. So now what we can show is that uh, if the principle, if the symbols of the source are not vanishing on the curve, yes. Uh, uh, if, the, if the symbols are not vanishing on the curve, uh, then if, if these two curves intersect at this interface, there's nonlinear response because the solution is not smooth. So we know there's nonlinear response. And then if the point is on this interface, and then we can determine the principal symbol of A, because A is the nonlinear parameter, we can determine the symbol uniquely by this data set. And uh, in case when this A is a characteristic function of a uh, domain, so it's uh, one in the domain uh, and otherwise zero, using this type of uh, measurement, we can determine what is A. So if it's a characteristic function, uh, piecewise constant. Okay, so I have five minutes. Uh, so the last part is the interaction of elastic waves. And so I would just briefly uh, mention what we uh, know of for this problem. So now we eventually go back to the elastic wave equation. Uh, we want to consider, okay, so of course we're interested in the interface problem, especially uh, because it's important in the seismology. However, before we go to that problem, we have to solve one problem is the wave interaction of two elastic waves. Okay, so therefore we consider this experimental setup. So in the space-time picture, you have this omega and the, you have this uh, cylinder okay, at a later time. And we consider initial boundary value problem for this elastic wave equation. This F is supposed to be supported on the boundary. This is the input source that we, we want to we control and generate the wave. So this equation is a, a second order quasi linear. We establish a local wave positive for small boundary data because otherwise there could be a shock wave. Uh, it's very complicated. And then the measurement we use for this problem is the so-called displacement to traction map. So you have this F is a source on the boundary, and we measure its traction, which is new dot S of U, as new is the exterior normal. So this is a, if you know the uh, uh, DTN type of problem for, for uh, inverse problem, this is just the analog of the DTN um, map problem. And the goal is to determine all these elastic parameters, lambda, mu, A, B, and C. So uh, our th the theorem that we are, uh, this is still in progress is that all these parameters can be determined from the displacement to traction map. Okay, so, all right, uh, for, uh, there's a summary of the linear, for the linearized problem, this is, uh, uh, this is a extensive, extensive study. So now for the nonlinear part, for the nonlinear scalar wave equation, uh, hyperbolic DTN map problem has been uh, studied by Akan Nakamura for a one-dimensional space, uh, one-dimensional wave equation. And the reason they generalized that to the, uh, uh, to, to for higher dimensions. However, in their approach, uh, they only obtain a, a uniqueness result. They can show that two, uh, they, they consider scalar wave equations show that the nonlinear parameters are, are the same. However, using our approach, we want to understand, we want truly understand, we, we deal with the system, and we truly want to understand what happens for this nonlinear interaction. So, and also, by, by analyzing this nonlinear interaction, we are able to uh, uh, construct the nonlinear parameters. So, uh, that's why, uh, okay, so uh, this is the difference of this work. Okay, so I would just uh, say a few words about the, uh, the difficulties for the elastic wave equation, uh, why uh, it's, uh, Interesting. So again, we, we, we consider this two wave interaction. We, we, we construct two sources from the boundary. However, now you see these this sources are supported on the boundary. Uh, this is a boundary value problem. So we need to uh, uh, use uh, the microlocal construction for the boundary value problem, which is uh, more technical than the one we used before. And also, uh, if you consider this linearized equation, 
the elastic system, there is a unique feature for elastic system, which is not even in the Einstein equation for, uh, for uh, in general relativity, is that it has two wave speed for this isotropic uh, elastic wave equation, it has two wave speed. So now when you construct the source and send a wave, potentially you can send, you, potentially you can uh, have two waves, one is P wave and one is S wave. So that's why for this problem, when we consider this interaction, when we consider this interaction, there could be new waves, only from two wave interaction, because the wave speeds are different. So we have two P wave interaction, you could generate two uh, S wave. And if you have P S wave interaction, you can generate P and S wave, and S S interaction will generate uh, P and P wave. So because I already told you that if for scalar wave equation, two wave interaction won't generate new waves. And this is the unique feature for the system, is that only two waves will generate a new wave because of this uh, decomposition. So we analyze the, uh, the PP interaction, we uh, write down this symbol and analyze this wave front, and then uh, we, we show that uh, all these parameters can be determined from these nonlinear responses.